Okay, today's study, we're going to start the Gospel of John. It's a pretty awesome book. And uh, just so you know, as we start in chapter 1, I usually read in the New King James translation of the Bible. It retains the familiarity of the King James, but many of the words and phrases have been uh, updated. And they've changed meanings in the last 400 years since the KJV was translated. And you'll notice, uh, I also like to use the Amplified Version and to bring out some more fuller meanings of some of the words and phrases and a lot of things that were in the footnotes of uh, the original translations are actually in the text of the Amplified. And also for a flyover reading, sometimes I'll use uh, the NLT or the New Living Translation. So that, that set aside, let's uh, go ahead and start reading in the Gospel of John, chapter one, beginning in verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. All right, let's, let's uh, start concentrating on the first three verses here. And that is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Now those, those words, the first three words especially, are so familiar in the beginning. Where else have we heard those words? Right, right. Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God, Elohim, created by forming from nothing the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, or waste and emptiness, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, or the primeval ocean that was covering the unformed earth. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering and brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, pleasing and useful, and that he affirmed and sustained it. And God separated the light, distinguishing it from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Now, of course, that was from the Amplified Version. See what I mean about that? Lots of details there. But let's, let's look at it from the very foundations here. What does it matter? I mean, who cares about something that existed or happened long before anyone that you and I know was even here, okay? What does it matter? Well, this is what matters. I, I've come to realize a person's worldview determines an awful lot about how they, leave, how they live their lives. And um, even a society's worldview determines how they structure the laws and the government and the expectations they have of how people should live and behave. For instance, if you have the worldview that it's that we're just one big cosmic accident, one big cosmic mistake, a series of accidents that evolved from nothingness into somethingness, it's a foregone conclusion that really nobody's life even matters. And also that also means there's no absolute truth and you're left without any real true guidance and Truth becomes meaningless, and truth is only relative to how much your own mind interprets it. So you're left without any real meaning in life, any real guidance for true ways, or any real meaning in life. Okay, that's, that's pretty sad, honestly. But thank God we don't have to guess at what happened long before we had you know, our, our iPhone cameras and... Um, you know, camcorders or, or even books or scrolls to document events. We have an eyewitness to the very beginning of the universe. And even better, he chose to tell us about it. Isn't that amazing? The God of the universe. The good news is that we have no reason to doubt the word of God who was there when the creation happened. And we have every reason to doubt those who claim or those who are pushing an evolutionary tale, people who were never there, okay? We'll talk about why they push such a worldview in just a few minutes, but I wanna encourage you to take some time when you get a chance to go online to answersingenesis.com 
It's a great website and it has massive amounts of evidence to the truth of creation. And um, if you're traveling, be sure to put Kentucky's Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter in your travels. There's uh, several days worth of, of very rich information you'll get from God's Word that they have all documented and laid out. Very good. But today, let's connect some of the dots to our passage today. In Genesis, you heard that God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the original Hebrew languages from people that are much better in Hebrew than I am tell us that the word Elohim is for God, and it's quite an interesting word. The word Elohim is actually a paradox in itself because it's both a singular word referring to one being, and at the same time, it's a plural word, meaning several people, meaning three. And this was known to people that were reading the Hebrew scriptures or what we call the Old Testament, but it was not really fully understood until Jesus came on the scene. As the, the New Testament reveals the fullness of God as God the Father, God the Son and Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Now we do see in these very first verses, Genesis 1 verse 2, we see the Spirit of God as a participant in creation, as he was surveying the formless earth. But you know, until Jesus came, there was a missing piece. People didn't really understand uh, all, all the details. And you know, another interesting thing is that uh, Jesus is being called the Word here as the book of John begins to unfold. Now, this is really a beautiful rendition. Uh, the original Greek, the word was logos, and the way it was written, it really clearly meant the divine expression or divine communication. I think that's pretty awesome because it tells us Jesus is clearly shown from the very beginning here as being divine. Jesus is God. And he declared, it's declared to us from the very first verse of the Gospel of John. Jesus came to communicate. He came to communicate and express the heart of God and the mind of God to us as humans, mere mortals. His life not only explains, it also builds on and illustrates the revelation of the God that created the earth and the heavens thousands of years earlier. So our first life lesson today is Jesus is God, the revelation of God himself to mankind. Jesus is God, the revelation of God himself to mankind. And that is so awesome. You know, some people say, I won't believe God is real unless he shows himself to me. It's a little arrogant sounding, but guess what? He did. He came. He taught God's ways. He did miracles in front of both his followers, those who believed in him or came to believe in him, and he also did it in front of those who hated his guts, okay? They didn't believe in him and refused to believe in him. He did that and so much more. Plus, it was written down by multiple witnesses, and he did that to show us that God is absolutely real, okay? Jesus is the only figure in history that was 100% man, and at the same time, he was 100% God. So you may be wondering as we look into this, why is the divinity of Jesus Christ so very important? Glad you asked. Let me explain. When we say Jesus Christ, first of all, we're actually saying our Savior's name, Jesus, or in the, the Hebrew is Yeshua, meaning Savior. Um, but that was, his, that was his given name, Jesus, Yeshua. And his title is Christ, or Mashiach, Messiah in Hebrew. So Jesus means, that's a given name, and then Christ means that he is Jesus the Messiah, or Yeshua the Messiah. And it's okay to use our Lord's name in any language, okay? Some people say, oh, I have to say it in, in its original form. Oh, it's okay, you know? God knows exactly who you're talking about when you say Jesus or when you say Yeshua. So don't, don't get hung up on that. But I want to tell you about how it's important to see that Jesus claims to be God throughout the scripture here, throughout John. Every time he says, I am, he's claiming to be God. That's how God first introduced himself to Moses back in Exodus 3 when God first revealed himself to mankind. And that's verse 6 in Exodus 3 says, Moreover, he said, I am 
the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And then in verse 14 it said, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said this, and he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, we see Jesus using this term, this phrase, all through the book, book of John. And we also see how the unbelieving religious leaders around him were cringing just about every time he says it. The Jewish people knew he was claiming the divinity every time he used it. John 6, 48, he said, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, he'll say, I am the light of the world. John 10, 9, he'll say, I am the door. John 10, 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine. Over and over, Jesus claims to be God. In John 10, 30, he clearly claimed divinity when he said, I and the Father are one. When he healed people, he also forgave their sins. Only God can do that. In John 20, 27, Thomas saw the resurrected Jesus and called him God. He said, you know, Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus freely received that worship. Take a look at that. You don't find a prophet receiving the honor of God. You don't see an angel. In fact, uh, when, when people bow down to an angel, they, they stopped them. Don't worship me, only worship God. And yet Jesus received that worship. Uh, Matthew 8, uh, 28, 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That is the all, all the power of God. So our life lesson is, Jesus was the Christ. Excuse me, let me back up. The life lesson is, Jesus the Christ was and is God. Jesus the Christ was and is God. Now, in case there's any doubt about Jesus being the creator, Colossians makes it very clear. Chapter 1, verses 15 and 20 say, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him, and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist as he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead and in all things that he may have preeminence for it pleased the father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. That, that's pretty clear, okay? But there's nothing ambiguous about the word of God when it's telling you the truth of God. Now, a few minutes ago, we talked about some of the myths of evolution. And once you see what's called evidence without bias, it takes a lot of blind faith to believe in evolution, okay? There's, there's more speculation and, and frankly, We've seen many examples of falsification of evidence and changing the, the thought patterns. They, they change from time to time. They'll say, oh, well, it didn't happen that evolutionary way. It actually happened this evolutionary way because uh, as, as facts get in the way of their stories, they have to change their stories. So, you know, they don't like to admit that very much, but much of what they consider to be true when I was growing up just a few years ago, um, that is no longer even considered in the books. And if you open a book, textbook from 30 years ago, 40 years ago on evolution, it's written totally different than what it is today. A lot of the examples they use that were falsified are now omitted from the books. Some of them remain. But see, what happens is this evolutionary tale just doesn't stand the test of time. It doesn't withstand proof and evidence and, and testing in the long term but you know the bible does speak with truth and certainty it has never changed since it was given to mankind life after death the intents of the hearts and people's attitudes 
of all people, the beginning of our one race. You know, there's only one race on the planet of people, and that's Adam's race, all from one blood, also known as humans. Don't be deceived. When people talk about what race are you? I am human race. I am of Adam's race. That's the only race there is. And you know, our problem is not the color of skin. Our problem is the problem of sin in people's lives. And the, the one and only solution to our problem is Jesus' love and forgiveness for each one of us that will receive him into our lives. So our life lesson here is that you can trust the Bible above all else. You can trust the Bible above all else. Now let's continue in, the, in John chapter 1 and let's look at the next two verses. Verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now you probably figured I'd go to the Amplified again and I, and, and I am. In him was life and the power to bestow life and the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it and is unreceptive to it. Okay, it kind of explains a little further about the light and the life that Jesus gives. And here we see two very important gifts that are given to us from God. First, there's life, life itself. Who gave us life? Yes, your life was a gift directly given to you from Jesus Christ. Genesis 2, 7 tells us how that happened. It says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. See, God, Jesus, created man, and then he created woman. When you go back, read Genesis 1 and 2, you can discover amazing details. He created all the elements, the oceans and land, rich in minerals, and then he put everything there to sustain and multiply that life right around us. We didn't have to go off somewhere else to try to find it. We couldn't, it was all right around us. You know, our science, scientists have been monitoring, they have spent billions of dollars monitoring the expanses of space, outer space, and, and even sending probes all over the galaxy to, to try to find what? Inactivity, dullness, rocks, death? No, of course not. They're looking for life, okay? And I, you know, personally, I'm fascinated by these efforts, and I know that if they find anything, um, they'll find that God created that life as well, if they find another life somewhere else in the, in the universe. But that's what they're looking for. They're looking for life in the creator of life and how it came into being. And God has given it to us in his very word. Now, uh, I remember uh, a few years ago, I heard, heard a story where uh, it, it's, it's, it's not true. It's not in the Bible. It's, it's kind of a cute little story explaining the power of God. But um, it was, you know, God and Satan were, were talking to each other. And Satan says, I can make a man just as good as you can. And uh, God said, I'll take that challenge. You start. So Satan reaches down and pulls up a handful of dirt. And God says, uh-uh, no, you have to go use your own dirt. <laughs> okay. Obviously, God created everything that there was. So as we go through the book of John, we're going to find 38 times where life is mentioned. We'll see how God intended for us to have eternal life from the very beginning. But man rebelled against God. And he was also told that it would bring death, yet he was deceived and he rebelled against God of his own volition instead. And God still, even in the midst of man's rebellion, he wants to restore to us the full life that he had originally intended for us to have. And on top of that, it's not just a take it everybody or leave it everybody, he lets each one of us decide for ourselves to choose that life or to not choose that life. And although Adam and Eve chose death and darkness for the entire world, God has given light to shine in that darkness. And verse 5 tells us that the light shines in the darkness even though the darkness doesn't understand it, it can't overpower it, and it's not receptive to it. But still, the very nature of light causes darkness to flee. 
You ever walked into a room and turned on the dark? <laughs> no, it doesn't happen that way, does it? We don't have dark switches for rooms because darkness can never overcome the light. The light of God illuminates our lives, shows us the right way, and it also exposes the, the wrong ways of man. It exposes the darkness for what it is. Now, earlier we talked about how many people spend their time and their energy. Uh, some people even spend their entire lives promoting a worldview that leaves out any mention of God or any possibility of God being real and, and the Bible being true. And you wonder, why is that? Well, it's not because the Bible is false, that's for sure. It stood the test of time. It's never been proven wrong, although literally millions of people have tried to prove it wrong. No, no, they want to discredit the Bible. Why? Because the light shines on their own selfish deeds and their rebellion against God. They don't want that light to shine. The only honest thing they could do if they saw that light or if they admitted that the light was shining on their darkness would be to repent which simply means change their mind, accept the truth of God, and then turn their life over to him and live for him. And honestly, I, I think they're just afraid to make that change. They're afraid of what they don't understand yet. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray for unbelievers. Pray that the binding influences from the enemy over their, their soul will be lifted. The blinders will come off of their eyes and that the word of God that you share with them will take root in their lives and bring them eternal life as Jesus desires. As we'll see in our journey through the book of John, this book of John, the Gospel of John, was written for that very purpose. In John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. The Bible contains the answers to all of life's vital questions and, and changes the very lens of the worldview through which we view reality. It teaches us to have a true, meaningful relationship with God. It's the glasses, so to speak, that brings into focus all of the things that God has for you in this life and in eternity. I want to share with you a few verses that illustrate the overall plan of salvation to help you come to a decision for Jesus. And the first one talks about how God loves you. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's in Found in John chapter 3, verse 16. It also tells us, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I give you the references so you can check it out for yourself. It is in the scripture. It is true. Now, the next thing we, we've got to understand is that we're all sinners. Okay? Everyone has sinned. Uh, scripture says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3, 23. And in Romans 3, 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. You know, if there's, if there's some guy over in the, you know, down the road that could have lived a perfect life, there would have been no reason for Jesus to come and die for your sins and to, to provide salvation. But we're all sinners. We've all sinned. In fact, uh, Romans 6, 26 tells us about that. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is a remedy for sin. There's a way to overcome that. John 1, 12 tells us, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now that, brothers and sisters, is good news. And another part of the good news is that all may be saved now. God wants to, to bring you salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus wants a relationship with you. In fact, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He wants that personal fellowship with you today. 
Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who's that talking about? Yeah, he's talking about me. He's talking about you. And you can talk to God through prayer right now. Share your heart with him. He's always listening. He's faithfully listening for you to call on him. And you can begin your new life of faith. Even if you've wandered away and want to renew a relationship with God, I encourage you to pray a simple prayer to bring Jesus into your life. If you've never done it before, you can do that today now and, and be given that new eternal life. Just something simple like this. God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I'm in need of salvation. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again to bring me a new life. I ask to receive your forgiveness and grace. And I choose to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you can pray that prayer sincerely from your heart, the Bible says that your sins have been forgiven. They've been wiped out. They're forgotten by God. And you are now a child of God. And after making your decision to receive Christ, we encourage you to prayerfully seek a healthy Christian community in your local church that will help you continue to grow in your walk by teaching and following the clear teachings of the Bible. Now, please let me or my wife know that you prayed for the first time and you're, or, or if you're renewing your relationship with God. And we'd love to know and even send you a few things that will help you start and help you grow in your faith. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Now, that's some good news, and I'm going to close it out for now uh, and we're going get, to get back in we're going to jump in to uh, starting at verse 6 the next teaching but I want to take a, a moment to, to bless you with a blessing that God has been uh, blessing believers with for thousands of years and that is the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for coming today. Um, hope to see you next week. And if there's anything that, you, again, you need prayer for, please see me or myself. God bless you and thank you for watching.